One in five suffer. Erase the stigma. Brain difference is not a crime. Mental health isn't just your problem. It's our problem. And now, Mental Health Monday with Marla and Dave. Welcome, Welcome to, to Mental, Mental Health, health Mondays. Mondays. Wow, Marla, look at you putting that big old S on Mental Health Monday. Well, because I've been, listen, you only have to chastise <laughs> me once in this lifetime. All right, right up front, we want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by the Killaby Center for Recovery, uh, the Mindful Revolution Addiction and Treatment, and the Natural Rest House uh, Detox Residential Center. And our guest is none other than Scott Killaby. Wow, we are so blessed, honored, <laughs> grateful, and honored. Uh, Scott Killaby is an internationally recognized and sought after author, teacher, and speaker on the subject of mindfulness and non dual wisdom as it applies to addiction, anxiety, trauma, and depression. He is also known for his work helping spiritual seekers recognize the enlightenment through present moment awareness. Scott is the founder of the Living Inquiries Community and the founder and CEO of the Killaby Center for Recovery. Ah, he does a lot. Located in the beautiful Palm Springs area of California, with many more accomplishments and accolades accredited to this amazing person. When we come back, we are both eternally grateful uh, and, and totally excited, excited about excited. our conversation with Scott Killaby. When we come right back, you guys, don't move. Buckle up. It's going to be a great one. Help someone who is struggling by supporting the National Alliance on Mental Illness and be a part of the NAMI effect. Hope starts with you. Hey guys, listen up. Learn something. All right, uh, like I said, uh, we're going to have an amazing conversation today. And and before we went on air, I was actually joking around, but kind of not joking, kind of cracking, but facking, as they used to say, uh, that I was fanboying on uh, our guest today, Scott Killaby. And uh, when well, I have to, oh, go ahead. first of all, we all have known you and we've we've been, you know, we've been in front of an audience for a very long time. This is quite a statement you just made there it You're is non-fanboy type and, and i'm going to tell you why first of all let's welcome mr scott gillaby yeah. <laughs> uh, wow so when uh our our, our, our other co-producer uh, hannah first told me about scott uh, i went immediately and got the book that she was she referred to me uh the natural rest for addiction started reading it and then as i even as i went to get that book i was like wait a minute well, which book should i get first started searching because i realized that he is a very prolific author uh and actually it was the first time that uh, a concept uh that we had been uh, uh introduced to many years ago actually made more practical sense as i actually started reading the book and so that concept of mindfulness uh, it's something that way back when uh, Eckhart Tolle first came on the scene, he now. was very uh, popular and Marla read all of his books and was really trying to get me to get into it. And for some reason, it didn't hit me then. Uh, but now I was like, man, this is not only amazing, but as I started to digging into Scott's background, he's an amazing individual. So, Scott, Let's start there. welcome to the show. Thank you, uh, Marlon Dave. It's great to be here. Awesome. <laughs> so why don't we uh, go all the way back to the beginning? And I didn't even mention that you were a lawyer, a musician, as I'm a musician, a songwriter, and you had another whole life before this totally. that led into a, a different kind of pathway that kind of led to this pathway. So why don't you bring us up to speed and give us a little bit about your background and history? Yeah, in my 20s, or I guess starting from the age of 14, I was really, I wanted to be a, a songwriter and a musician and, and be famous. Yeah. And I devoted my whole life to that. And then, of course, that led to a drug addiction, which is why we're here mm. probably today. And then I became an attorney at some point as a way to try to move away from uh, the addiction, of course. That's mm -hmm. what we do when we have addiction. So now, not to interrupt you, but I'm kind of interrupting. Yeah. Now, were you over the addiction by the time you became the no, attorney? No, that's part okay. of the story. Okay. So the worst three years of my addiction were, were the first three years of my being an attorney, if you can wow. imagine. Yeah. So I hit rock bottom about three years into being practicing law. Hmm. And the rock bottom led me to get clean and sober and then eventually to this work. 
for the moment. Mm. So now wow. the initial process that uh, about getting clean and sober was that the twelve step program. It was, yeah. It and so tell tell us about how that helped, uh, the, and then the areas that you saw could be improved upon. Well, what it helped, there was a lot of support in that community, and it was it was my first foray into spirituality after being uh, addicted to drugs and alcohol. So it was really helpful mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, after a while, I started to, oh, because I was a spiritual seeker. Ah. So I just and what does that mean when you yeah. say yeah, spiritual yeah, you seeker? Yeah, explain that a little bit. Yeah, it's hard. Like, for those who have that bug, there are lots of people on earth mm -hmm. who get that bug. They just start looking for something more, uh, some sort of deeper freedom or, or truth. And it's like, I call it like you get, you get the bug. It's mm -hmm. almost like you get the bug, and once you have it, you can't let go. And, and I went searching for answers all over the world mm -hmm. outside of the 12-step program and finally found this kind of work that I do now. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just ask you to just keep this as close as you can because gotcha. you're in for, yeah, there you go. Because it, it, later people are like, we really, we wanted it, we yeah. couldn't hear. So when you say a spiritual seeker, because I would, I basically, would you say I'm a spiritual seeker as well, no. Marla? No. <laughs> so Marla says I'm not a spiritual seeker. No, no, no. Seeker. What, they, let, me, let, me, let me clear that up because I understand, but you, I understand and, completely what you're saying. Yes. Because to me, it's that deeper sense of, I'm not looking for answers within any particular uh, religion or yes. a construct. Right. I just want an answer for for my soul's satisfaction of right. healing and freedom. You're looking right. to not be bound to the things that you know. To me, everything about an addiction of to anything is an escape. Yeah, even and exercise. Yeah. And that's why I asked Marley would she consider me a spiritual <laughs> seeker because I'm really just in it for the you're information. An, you're intellectual. I, I'm yes. an intellectual seeking well, that can information turn into uh, being a spiritual seeker. So, I, like I've read the Buddha Vista, I've read uh, different spiritual books, but uh, it's not that that's something that I choose that I want to live my life that way. If right. that makes any sense, but I do have the information. So, yes. continue. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Well, I was just saying that I went seeking for the, you know, I like what Marla just said, is that it's not within any religion or paradigm or belief system. This mm -hmm. whole awakening is really getting to the core of who we are. And that's when we start looking at ego and, and our mm -hmm. mind-based sense of self. And so our mind-based sense of self looks for belief systems and paradigms for, for security and safety. But as you start to question the ego with inquiry or from awareness, when you start to question that, you find out that your thoughts really aren't who you are. This is a strange realization that happens. Mm. And you start to recognize that you're this awareness prior to thought, which is a profound awakening that you can have. And it's really not about a belief system. You really hit the, the nail on the head. Because I think a lot of people would think that this is just another belief system. Right. Or, or the spiritual search, which is what I would really say, honestly, Dave is someone who searches and seeks. But I think that the difference between what you're saying is mm -hmm. you, you and that's an you, important nuance yes so go ahead. For, for me yours is to to gain knowledge to to almost challenge a particular paradigm at all times with different ideas and different uh processes and religions that's mm -hmm. the way i know you to be. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't yeah. yeah so in other words your core belief is a rock that cannot be moved so what? So what? Scott right. Saying, so in, the, in right. that sense, I'm not actually seeking. Right. I'm not trying to move. <laughs> you found it. Right. right. It exactly. Like, yeah. Yours. Yours is more of a spiritual justification. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That that's a, probably a better a, a better way of saying it. So, but let's dig more into the yeah. mindfulness concept, mm -hmm. uh, because like I was saying, as I started reading the book, I started seeing more of a practical application yeah. to mindfulness versus some of the other things that I've read that seem so esoteric. Yeah. So one thing I like about the the, the way that we we use this work, we meaning the facilitators that do this work and, mm -hmm. and the way I'm sharing it is it, it has practical application for people. It's mm -hmm. not, it's like when you read some of the esoteric uh, traditions or, mm -hmm. or it is, it gets heady and you, mm -hmm. and, and very conceptual. And then, so what I liked about Eckhart Tolle, he was one of my teachers, wow. is that he brought the practical in. He, mm -hmm. he was, really wasn't speaking within esoteric knowledge. He right. was very practical. So I took a, a lead from him and began to like really make it as more practical as, even th than he did right. as, as best I could. Even mm -hmm. He's very good at it. But my whole point is it has to be experiential. You have to, you have to feel it in your bones and your tissues and your breath and your, your whole presence um, to really embody this. And um, it, for that to happen, it has to be practical. It can't just be conceptual mm -hmm. and belief based. Right. Otherwise, it's in the head. So. And, I, and I'll say you did a very good job of expressing its practicality versus the esoteric because that was the first time, like I said, that I actually started feeling a practical application oh, nice. was possible. Good. Uh, so, uh, like I said, this conversation is going to move very quickly because, as you know, it's a 30 minute show and we, it's going to be jam packed. Mm -hmm. We are excited. Uh, Scott Kilby is our guest. Uh, don't move. It's going to be a good one. When Dave and Marla get together, it's hot. 
The Kellerby Center for Recovery is the first primarily mindfulness-based addiction, depression, and anxiety treatment center in the U.S. The non-12-step approach is based on founder Scott Kellerby's book, Natural Rest for Addiction. The Killaby Center is located in the beautiful community of Palm Springs, California, and provides 24-hour care for individuals seeking addiction treatment with step-down programs to help clients integrate back into their daily lives. A recipient of the Joint Commission's gold seal of approval for behavioral health care accreditation, the Killaby Center for Recovery is proud to display this symbol of quality that reflects the organization's commitment to provide a safe and effective care. Over 84% of clients reported complete relief from symptoms of trauma and wow. 95.7% of clients reported complete relief from anxiety. Over 87% of the Killaby Center for Recovery's clients reported complete relief from depression and 100% wow. of clients who presented who were presented with suicidal thoughts when they first came to the Killaby Center of Recovery left with no suicidal thoughts at all. Needless to say, the Killaby Center for Recovery's mindfulness-based methods are effective. So, as always, if you or someone you love suffers from addiction, depression, anxiety, or a dual diagnosis, please, we ask you, contact the Killaby Center of Recovery today by calling 866-545-6295 or visit the website <coughs> killabycenter.com today. It's time for the Mental Health Minute with Marla and Dave. Partners always saying, don't cough. <laughs> All right. Mental health problems and substance use disorders sometimes occur together. According to mentalhealth.gov, this is because certain illegal drugs can cause people with an addiction to experience one or more symptoms of a mental health problem. Or mental health problems can sometimes lead to alcohol or drug use as some people with a mental health problem may misuse these substances as a form of self-medication. Another reason could be mental and substance use disorders share some underlying causes, including changes in brain composition, genetic vulnerabilities, and early exposure to stress or trauma. More than one in four adults living with serious mental health problems also have a substance abuse, a substance use problem. Substance use problems occur more frequently with certain mental health problems, including depression, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, Per and personality disorders. If you or anyone you know is dealing with a dual diagnosis of a substance use disorder and, a, and another mental health condition, please, and I say again, please seek professional help. This Mental Health Minute was brought to you by NAMI San Fernando Valley and Loving Beyond Reason. David is a thinker. I never do anything without thinking about it first. Marla is a feeler. I basically wear my personality on my scene. But when Marlon and Dave get together, it's like a match dancing with a firecracker. I like the fact that Scott got that. He, <laughs> I, he already knows who the match and who the firecracker is. And I think they might both be in me. I don't know. <laughs> yes, so I'm wanna, just along for the ride. So Trust. I'm, I have personal questions that, so one of the things that drives me towards solutions is I would confess to being a person who is, has a a deep discontentment mm. i'm just i can recognize i'm just not content and when i think i'm where i need to be i then i need to there's more like this was the mountain oh wait it wasn't high enough that was well that's just the hill to get me to the next mountain i got to get over there so i want to know how you plugged in the principles which i understand which are literally you talk about mindfulness mindfulness and presence being to, in the moment. to to apply that to overcoming and maintaining a life free of addiction because i recognize a lot of my habits are escape they're just they they are definitely numbing things that i make excuses for to just it's the truth i you know i'm like okay this i you know just let me just unwind you know it, it's, it's a problem. Yes. Okay. So this is why we focus on the drivers under addiction. This is a new thing. We call it a new model of recovery where we don't focus on the behavior, which is you're using to medicate the problem. Mm -hmm. We focus on the drivers, the pain that drives the addiction. So that's trauma, discontent, stress, shame, self-esteem issues, boredom, chronic pain. All those things can drive addiction. 
because they're all about discontent. That's one word of way of saying it. You can say stress or whatever, but it's really about human pain. And I was going to say when you said that you live in discontent, I have worked with people all over the world, like thousands and thousands of sessions. I just want to tell you, you're not alone. You're mm. not alone. But we have these private thoughts we don't often share with other people. You're mm -hmm. sharing it here. I know it because I've worked with people. Mm -hmm. And I just want to let you know you're not alone. And I felt the same way. And mindfulness did help me. It was the only thing that actually got to the discontent. Right. Because the discontent is in the mind. It's in the mind, the stories of the mind, and how we show up, with, how the emotions show up with those stories mm -hmm. about ourselves and our lives. And so mindfulness is about watching those thoughts and inquiring into them and letting go of those and getting into the body and feeling these feelings and letting mm. go of those so that we just live in presence. We're not so, hanging on all that. So it's not even bizarre that as I've as I've grown into connecting with myself, I tell him all the time now, I feel it often that I can now almost I call it flying back from myself and I can see yeah. myself and my intent and my everything in a moment without actually it literally i it's gotten to that point and i'm like okay well i i it, i told somebody the other day i feel sometimes like i'm wide awake in a nightmare of call me yeah. i'm a wide awake but i know it's like oh i can't turn on look over there because i know i already know the monster's there and i keep feeding them the wrong stuff and i'm just expecting yeah. i get it yeah yeah and so one thing we, d we <clears throat> developed inquiry i won't go much into it but inquiry is a way of pulling up those demons that we hide in our consciousness our mm -hmm. unconsciousness we pull them right up into mm. awareness and face them directly they're actually just thoughts and feelings mm. but they seem like monsters and real strong things when we avoid them and push them on our unconscious by bringing them up into awareness we see them for what they are they're actually just thoughts and and, now, feelings. and, and does the monster get bigger the more that you ignore those the monster bingo and so after a while pretty it, you're overwhelmed yes. with the monster so to speak uh is speaking in, uh, on that level and right. then suddenly you don't you're overwhelmed right most of our job at the treatment center and online with people is getting them to stop doing that mm -hmm. and start bringing this bringing this stuff into the light of awareness and letting go of it but yeah it does fester and that's why people come to us because if they push it in their unconscious it shows up as depression anxiety and addiction often but and that's why people, the whole world, it really is, is, is that well, way. Well, Scott, what have you? What com what comes first? And I'm going to ask questions that I know people want to know. In your <laughs> mind, what comes first? Because our son, um, his formal diagnosis is bipolar one with schizoaffective disorder. Mm. But as we've gone through, he's now in his 30s, and as we've gone through an understanding of this journey. We, the question I had was, you know, he at one point severe drug use. And so he, you know, overcame, you know, his addiction um, to, to a large meaning completely. But the bottom line is what came first, the chicken or the egg? So mm. when you mention this, you're mentioning which a lot of people dismiss or they separate mental brain differences and issues with a drug addiction and and abuse, drug right. abuse and substance abuse. They're intrinsically linked. That's the, that's the issue. So people, if, if they grew up through child development, we grow up with carrying pain and not processing pain and our ego develops and some people develop a mental illness, as you know, and with, with that, then a substance abuse, a co-occurring substance abuse happens. And then as that happens, it looks like we're self-medicating and it's helping us and it does in the beginning, but actually the substance use after a while compounds the yeah, mental illness. Right. and. When we treat people, we have to we have to show them that they're intrinsically related, and one drives the other. Mm. And then sometimes we have to integrate medicine with spirituality too. Right. Right. For sure. Man, well, you guys can hear the music just when I, <laughs> and it always comes at the wrong time for me because this conversation is too it's through the roof for me. Uh, Scott, when we come back, what I really want you to touch on is when that monster gets overwhelming and especially as you mentioned uh if you have a history of uh drug use or or uh, mental health or the lack thereof is that really just being out of balance as far as some of those areas are, areas are concerned and i want you to answer that as soon as we come right when we back. come back don't don't move you got to hear it All right, so as you know from that super fun music, it's time for the poll question. The poll question last week was what percentage of the adult population as Marla Poplock? So, a, I mean, I, that's a good skill. I've gotten good with chair dancing. <laughs> I love it. What percentage of the adult population in the U.S. suffer from mental illness? Your options were A, 11%, 18%, or 23%. Scott, what would you think? 
23, but I'm not sure. All right, all right. Well, the well, there was a time where that where the answer was even higher than that, but now we've gotten it down. And I say we worked hard at erasing the stigma and getting those numbers down, but it's down to 18 percent now. Marla, what's the poll question for next week? I thought you'd never ask. I did. The poll question next week is: What percentage of Americans live with a serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depression? Your choices: A, one percent; B, four percent; or C. 7%. And we, as always, because we're gracious hosts, we're going to give um, Mr. Killaby a chance to answer that. <laughs> so your your question again is, what percentage of Americans live with a serious mental illness like bipolar, schizophrenia, and major depression? 1%, 4%, or 7%? Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, 4%? Well, Man, well, he is an expert, and, uh, and you have to give your answer on our social media. <laughs> and so we'll let you know if he won the golden egg when he next week. <laughs> and you guys make sure you follow our social medias and when you see these uh, poll questions come up what do you do marla you have to vote there you go uh so scott i was asking you would another way to describe uh the lack of mental health um, and, and, and notice I didn't say mental illness, but I said the lack of mental healthiness mental that wellness. sometimes or mental wellness, which sometimes can be all the way extreme to a mental illness. But is that really just in balance of sort of uh, 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 what you were describing as being mindful and living in the moment? Yeah. People who, who don't register as having a mental illness still have a mental health imbalance. It, it could be the nervous system is depressed or mm. over anxious. And this is often why people are using things because mm -hmm. if, if someone's nervous system is really activated, they'll use something to, to bring it to homeostatic balance, to bring it back down. If something is depressed, you'll see them use stimulant to bring so it back up. up. So we're all living, especially the stressful world in a way we're really not balanced. We don't have presence in our lives, for example. And so we're prone to like those, those ups and downs. And that's where the using starts. Even if you're not, you don't have a mental mm -hmm. illness, uh, the, you know, a registered mental illness like mm -hmm. bipolar or depression or anxiety. Right, There's something that extreme. people out there that yeah. are just stressed. Sure. Yeah. Mm. So which, uh, which we Especially have found, nowadays. Which we, by the way, <laughs> when we got into um, NAMI family to family, one of the biggest takeaways, I call them takeaways, the biggest nugget I got was the true fracturing impetus for most issues is stress. Yes. And it's the it's all the things we do to manage the stress and treat the stress mm -hmm. improperly compounding that the problem. compound the issue. So and when I thought about that, this is something I shared with parents. Look at the key things in life that every human pivotal points where stress is naturally introduced, junior high to high school. Mm. You, then there's dating and then there's where are you going to school? What are you going to do with the rest of your life? There's the 18 year old, which I say, this is why I think schizophrenia is, is the is the disease of stolen lives. Because 18 to 25 is the fracturing point. Most a lot of it. My our son was in college. We can even go further back. There was a time when all of us ran around absolutely butt naked. The, and suddenly a time came and suddenly we didn't feel comfortable doing that. Right. Suddenly that's a restriction that we were programmed to understand that we weren't actually born with. So no wonder I'm stressed when I put my clothes on. <laughs> so, so Scott, uh, when we were talking about some of the numbers uh, in that advertisement that we read for the Killaby Center for Recovery, I mean, part of my initial when I said fanboying was I have never, ever seen numbers uh, that high and for success rates in some of the things uh, that you guys deal with. And so what, given that, as much as we've made uh, strides as far as mental health is concerned, what is the difference, do you think, in your approach to the standard and mainstream approach to mental health? Well, one of the big differences is that we don't engage in talk therapy because tra a lot of this stuff is trauma-based. Even depression mm. and anxiety stems from some sort of trauma from childhood. So we focus on trauma. And for trauma, you have to go into the body, the mm. somatic awareness in the body, because this is where trauma is stored. Mm -hmm. It's actually stored down here in our nervous system. It's a physical thing. That's right. So talk therapy will engage you only on the level of the mind. Mm. Ah. So, so trauma is stored in the body. It's going to miss that. So with inquiry and mindfulness, we go into the body to deal with and release these repressed emotions and things. And that's, that's, just, that's what I think makes the difference right there is the body part of it. So, do, so wow, is, is your program inpatient? Like do, do people come and stay at the Killaby Center? We have, a, we have a detox center, which they come and stay 24 hours, 24-hour 24 care. 
if they need detox or residential treatment. But the Killaby Center is a an outpatient program, so okay. they just come during the day. Got it. Yeah. Because uh, I'd be I'd be interested. Do you do seminars? I've done talks all, really all over the world. I don't do them much anymore. Um, we're doing most things online. So got if you it. go to my, Kill- my Scott Killaby public page, you'll see the advertisements for those particular events. Okay. That is amazing, man. So I talk want to, to us. Write that down. Yes, uh, and Tony, I guess we'll put that on the screen. Uh, talk to us about how your approach might be better at handling the stigma of mental illness. Well, it's one of the first things that we deal with is that people come in with, uh, for example, they've been diagnosed, um, diagnosed with bipolar or depression or anxiety. That can be helpful to find a diagnosis for sure. It gives. It's like, well, now I know what's wrong with me. Mm-hmm. At the same time, it can be damaging. Because then people take that on. It's a label, right? Right, it's a label they take on. And so what we do is we we destigmatize through present moment awareness. We allow them to see that, yes, it's practical to say, I have bipolar. But the thought of bipolar coming up, it can be a very stressful thought. Mm. So we let go of that. Especially with the stigma. Yeah, well, the stigma, exactly, yeah. shame. We, yeah. we call it shame. Mm. I mean, we internalize it as shame. The mm. stigma is the societal ramifications yeah. of that. Right. But internally, Still a shame. personally, it's shame. Yeah. Wow. So, and, and with all that being said, um, uh, again, the numbers for people who've come into your center and they were dealing with suicidal thoughts or tendencies, uh, the number of 100% leaving yeah. without those thoughts. Yeah, so we, we, we can work with suicidal ideation very easily through inquiry. Uh, this is one of, the, one of our secret sauces. Is, is Again, it's just pulling up these thoughts that are scary. If people have, they're, they're, they're having scary thoughts and their, their brain is producing an option for the first time mm-hmm. that was never produced before. The option mm. is to kill themselves. Mm. So through inquiry, we could just let those thoughts go and get into the body where the pain is and the fear and let that go. And then they get over the hump of suicidal ideation. But then they have to deal with the anxiety, right. the depression and the trauma or the mental illness after that. Uh, so before we actually go to break, I need to let you touch on parity loss. Yeah. Uh, so if you would. Yeah. Well, I'm, I was an attorney, so I'm very tuned into the parity law. So mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're making strides in the nation to bring mental illness up to par with medical. So the parity laws basically say that if you if you treat uh, something in the medical field like uh, diabetes, cancer, you should treat it people in the behavioral health field with the same, you shouldn't discriminate. Mm-hmm. You, insurance companies One should be more important than the other. No, and insurance companies shouldn't pay for medical but not behavioral health. Mm-hmm. That's what the parity laws say. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, the parity laws are not being followed very much mm-hmm. across the nation, and that's and, the movement. Now, do you think, uh, going jumping all the way back to your days as an attorney, do you think the main reason for that is because as a financial perspective, some of these mental health issues, they really don't have a cure until, <laughs> until the Killaby Center for Recovery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and ours isn't really a cure because it's an ongoing mindfulness. Yeah. Mm, it's not right. like you come there and you get fixed. You fix, and, yeah, yeah. It's stay. not like a cold. You don't right. right. You don't right. Take but it. I'm saying, but your your success rate is that now? Could that be a a, a, a way to turn that corner for the parity laws? Do you think? I th- I, I, I think so. It's, it, mm. You know, the insurance companies have to be open to it first. Right yeah. now, they're not closed, and only the lawmakers are making them open to it. Yeah. You know, until they're forced to be open to it by law. They're not going to listen to us that much because they don't they don't want to pay. I hate to it's say not, that. Right, it's not, it's nothing true. in it for them. Hey. You took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> and all of us who have grew, who have dealt with these issues know that very as f- we, firsthand. As we promised a lot of great information, we hate that we always come to an end. We'll be right back. Bad. What are you doing? Worthless. Don't, don't trust them. They'll hurt you. You're worthless. It's pointless. When the pain of schizophrenia meets hope, everything can change. Help someone who is struggling by supporting the National Alliance on Mental Illness and be a part of the NAMI effect. Hope starts with you. It's raw, real, and unfiltered. All right, Scott, so give us uh, your final takeaway. What is your one message, if you had one thing to be able to say as a mental health advocate, as a mindfulness advocate? Uh, well, there's a way out of suffering. That's the thing mm. I didn't know because you said discontent, Marla. You know, mm. I, I didn't know that there was a way out of that. I tried so many different ways, and I just want to tell people there is a way out of that. Right. You know, and, and, and one way out of it is, is mindfulness. Maybe other ways, but I found the way out of that. I don't suffer anymore like in the way that I used to. I don't have that mm. discontent or that boredom or 
that suffering. And so there's a way out. That's so, my message. So my, and so, the, so do, would you would you think it would be a suitable answer that my, I've decided my way out is to move to Australia? Is that, uh, you, I tried that. Do you sign off on that? Uh, I just well, I can't. I'm I sorry. <laughs> God, I knew it. Our guest has been Scott Killaby, uh, the CEO of uh, the Killaby Center uh, and Recovery. Uh, I, I will say this I, again. I've never seen effectiveness numbers uh, that you've been able to achieve, and we hope that we will have you back on the show because and we have a special we, offer we are for sure. Literally, just scratching the surface. Yeah, uh, it, it's a must. We always say that time is too short, but in this case, I might have to kidnap. Scott, because I, I know it's not even effective because I just told the whole world. Now you're going to try to come save him. But on a serious note, um, thank you so much. Follow Scott Killaby. Um, I, I have, we have um, Instagram. Um, there's a website. Um, yes. So, right. Killabycenter.com. So, wherever and get the information and look, I, get the books. We have them. Get yeah. the books. I'm telling you, it's, a, it's worth reading. Absolutely. So, Scott, Scott, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank man. you. You're so an amazing person. It. Yes.